Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Annette Raboli, and I have the honor of being the Dean of Cooper Medical School of Rowan University. I'd like to ask uh, you all to be seated. Let's observe a moment of silence to remember the lives lost 20 years ago on September 11, 2001. Thank you. President Hushmand, Provost Lohman, and colleagues, a heartfelt welcome to the family and friends of the class of 2025, including those who are participating remotely and could not be here with us today. What a happy occasion this is for our school community as we gather here in Fleer Concert Hall to welcome our newest junior colleagues into the profession of medicine. I'm going to ask the members of the class of 2025 to please stand and turn to face your family and friends who are here with you today. These are the people that have loved you and supported you on this amazing journey that you are on and will continue to do so. Please express your gratitude to them with a round of applause. This event is so important to our community that several dignitaries from Rowan University and from our major clinical affiliate, Cooper University Healthcare, in addition to our CMSRU leadership team, are here today to celebrate with us. You could turn around now and sit down. Uh, you follow directions very well, by the way. That's a good sign. Uh, and I'd like to recognize them. I'm going to ask them to stand and be acknowledged as I call their names. Please hold applause until the end. Rowan University leadership, Dr. Ali Hushmand, president and Dr. Anthony Lohman, Provost, Senior Vice President for Academic Affairs. Cooper University Healthcare Leadership, Dr. Anthony Mazzarelli, Co-President of Cooper University Healthcare and Associate Dean for Clinical Affairs, and Dr. Eric Coopersmith, Senior Vice President and Chief Physician Executive. Dr. Kara Applin, Vice President of the Cooper University Healthcare Medical Staff. CMSRU board member, Dr. Edward Viner. CMSRU deans, Drs. Ahmed Joshi, Rose Kim, William Coker, Harry Mazurek, Anthony Mazzarelli, Jocelyn Mitchell-Williams, Susan Perlis, Larry Weisberg, Darren Benning, Andrea Bataro, Sundip Patel, Aaron Pukanis, and our principal business officer, Mr. Nick Stamatiades. CMSRU Chairs, Dr. Michael DeSanto, David Fuller, Michael Goodman, Robin Perry, Anthony Rostain, Roland Schwarting, Bennett Schenker, Alan Turtz. And last but not least, our CMSRU Advisory College Directors who are sitting with their students, so please stand as I call your name, Drs. Lisa Reed, Ramya Latano, Anut Feingold, Donald Solomon, Samir Bader, Adam Green, Marina DiBartolo, Richard Fisher, Dory Sue Barrington, Emily DeMuth, Faye Young, Antoinette Spevitz, Emily Scattergood. Class of 2025, today you're going to do two things that will mark your formal entry into the profession of medicine. First, you will be cloaked with the white coat the symbol of the medical profession. It's a symbol that's relatively recent compared to the long and rich history of medicine. The wearing of the white coat started in the late 19th century. And the reason was that at the time there was a lot of mysticism and quackery in medicine. And a group of students and physicians wanted to emphasize the scientific basis 
for medicine. So they decided that physicians should wear a white coat representing the laboratory and science. But the white coat is merely a symbol. It's the qualities of the person who fills and wears the white coat that is important. White coat ceremonies are even more recent. The first one occurred in 1993 and was organized by Arnold Gold at Columbia University. Now they occur worldwide and are not just for the profession of medicine but for other health professions as well. The pin on your coat is a gift from the Arnold Gold Foundation. Please wear it wi wi uh, proudly. Dr. Jordan Cohen from the Arnold Gold Foundation has called humanism the passion that animates authentic professionalism. We are proud to have a gold humanism chapter at CMSRU and also a center for humanism that Dr. Viner leads. Secondly, you're going to recite the ancient oath of Hippocrates. This oath unites all physicians worldwide and throughout the ages in the art of healing. In taking the oath, you'll commit to the highest standards of our profession. Today, you become a medical professional. And you may ask, what is a professional? A medical professional is someone who accepts the responsibilities, the obligations, and the sacrifices that go with the privilege, and indeed, it is a privilege to study and practice medicine. But above all, a medical professional is someone who places the interests of the patient above their own. Class of 2025, you were chosen by our faculty admissions committee because they felt that you have the right stuff. We're a school that is very driven by our mission, and that is to serve our community, to develop you as culturally competent, culturally humble physicians who will be leaders and strong advocates for your patients. You are indeed the future of medicine and the future of our profession depends upon you. Class of 2025, medicine awaits you with open arms. Each of you is a very special person with a very special role to play. Each of you will need to discover, to develop, and then use your incredible talents and skills in the service of others. You will need to continue to develop the traits that are essential to the development of an excellent physician. Altruism, humility, commitment, kindness, respect, and compassion. This process has already begun, for in choosing medicine, you have proclaimed your desire to serve others. You have chosen to enter medicine during a global pandemic, and your attitudes will be forever shaped by this profound experience. Our job over the next four years is to help you become the person who fills your white coat with the attitudes and skills worthy of our noble profession. I wish you my best wishes for long and fruitful careers and much success at CMSRU. Thank you. It is truly an honor for me to introduce Dr. Ali Husman, president of Rowan University. Under his leadership, Rowan has been on an amazing meteoric rise nationally. His personal story as an immigrant to the United States is an inspiration for us all. President Hushman. Good afternoon, everyone. <clears throat> On behalf of the entire Rowan community, our board of trustees, our great faculty, students, the whole 25,000 of them, and myself, I'd like to congratulate all of you for this important day. Uh, I particularly like to congratulate the parents for first of all trusting your loved ones with us and would like to commit to you that we will return them back to you much more successful and ready to, to heal so many people. I want, you to I want to let you know that you really are highly selective students. This is one of the most selective medical schools in the nation and I can assure you for every one of the seats that you're occupying there have been at least 50 other deserving students. The reason that you are selected is not because of your academic credentials. You are all highly credentialed. And also for your passion and dedication to this field because it really requires that level of 
education. You have also selected a great university, a university on the rise, a university that for the past four years has been voted by Chronicle of Higher Education as fourth fastest growing research university in the nation. But this university in 2023 will become 100 years and this such a short period of time, it's gone through tremendous amount of changes. A colleague of mine two days ago gave me a copy of a newspaper that is dated October 12, 1917. The title of the newspaper or the name of the newspaper is the Maurice River Pilot. And two, uh, two headlines in that newspaper really caught my eyes. One of them says, tomato crops this year is a real record breaker. Maximum price is $1.50 per basket. And the other uh, headline was, Glassboro chosen for site of new normal school. Total cost of land is $16,000. Remember, you guys, for those of you who are in-state st students, this is almost 40% of your tuition and fees for one year. <laughs> and for those of you who are out of a state, it's probably, I don't know, 26, 27, some number like that. How times has changed. But that school started almost 100 years ago by a group of farmers in here. And this whole area was farm and fish farms. And they put their monies together and bought a plot of land. And they went to the state and they said, are you willing to open a normal school so that we can train future school teachers? And they did in 1923, it was opened with 250 students, all female, and all of them being trained to become primary teachers. And the school continued developing. Eventually, I started offering bac baccalaureate degrees. And it was not until 1992 that an industrialist, a graduate of MIT named Henry Rowan, who had just graduated with mechanical engineering, and him and his wife bought a house in New Jersey and went to their garage and developed the first industrial furnace. And as a result of that discovery and, the, and development, they have now created the largest corporation in the world that has 60% of the market of industrial furnace. And when some of our leaders approached them for, for a gift for $1,000 actually one year, and then he asked them, what do you want that $1,000 for? And they didn't have a good answer. He said no. A year later, I approached him, and they asked for $100 million with the promise of building an amazing engineering college. And he said yes. He had no affiliation with Rowan University. This was not a known school. This was an open access institution with five or 6,000 students and some people called it the party school. And it was 1992 that Henry Rowan committed $100 million as an industrialist, even though he could have given his money to MIT, who has what God knows how many billion dollars of endowment. And for those of you who care, I invite you to listen to Malcolm Gladwell's Revisionist History podcast, number one and number six. He talks about that $100 million gift. It was tr truly a pivotal moment in the history of this institution. As a result of that gift, in 1996, one of the greatest engineering colleges was developed and started in this university, and today is ranked 17th in the nation in undergraduate. That was a pivotal moment. As a result of that, we started offering more bachelor's and master's degree and hiring better faculty until 2000 and, uh, 2009, where Governor Corzine signed an executive order to create this medical school, this amazing medical school. And it was 2012 when we opened the door, and that was another pivotal moment for this university. That was when we went from a regionally classified master's offering institution that nobody knew about into Carnegie classified research to university in a space of seven years, the fastest ascension in the history of higher education. And all of that happened as a result of us creating medical school and having access to individuals like you, coming from all over this country with great credentials and looking for a place with a great medical school and you find Rowan. And that's very important. So those three pivotal moments, when uh, people in here gathered $5,000 and Henry Rowan gave $100 million and Governor Cozine signed the executive order and this school were created, really are the foundation of what Rowan is all about. 
Those are the pivotal moments. Every organization, every institution, and every person in their lives or in their history have pivotal moments that really shape them to who they are or who they become. Today is one of those pivotal moments for you. You're gonna become healers, the greatest people on the face of the earth who give from yourself in order to heal other people and make people better. Congratulations for entering to that club. It's a great club. Congratulations to the family for raising such an amazing kids. Thank you. Thank you, uh, President Hushmand. It's a pleasure for me to introduce our university provost, Dr. Anthony Lohman. Under his tutelage, we expect Rowan University will continue to evolve into a scientific and medical education powerhouse. Dr. Lohman. Thank you and, and welcome to our new students and, and families. Welcome to the Glassboro campus. Uh, Dr. Hushman gave you a, a wonderful story about how this campus has evolved and all the wonderful things that, that we've done and, and shaped. So now I'm, 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 I'm looking down and, and thinking about you and, and your next experiences here at Rowan. And what a, what a great time, what a great learning opportunity, what a great growth opportunity you're gonna have uh, with some outstanding faculty, outstanding facilities, and outstanding partners, clinical partners. So I'm, I'm, I'm just sitting here thinking, you know, this is a good time to celebrate. You've done an amazing job the last couple of years, proving a record, working hard, being committed. And believe me, I know what it, I know what it takes to get where you are. Uh, running an academic institution, I see our students, I, sometimes I write letters, I watch, I watch the work that you do, that you put in, the commitment and the dedication. And uh, you know, I also was, one time in an auditorium like this, many years ago starting my academic career, and, and I sat next in an auditorium like this with a room full of freshmen, students, all wanted to be pre-med, and they said, look to the right and look to your left, and I was the guy to your right. That was, that was me. <laughs> so I'm okay with that. I'm, I've done pretty well, I'm, I'm happy. But what I know is, I know the dedication, it's not just it's not just being the smartest student in your class. It's not just being the hardest work. It, it, it's being committed. So today, you, you've proven that you've got what it takes. And you know, I'm not gonna, I don't mean to scare you, but I think everyone has stepped in this room knowing now, now the harder part of the work, the hardest leg of your journey really begins. But you've, you've proven you've got it to get this far. Four years ago, you probably dreamed you were gonna have this spot, but I'll bet none of you predicted the path that you were gonna have to take to get here. 18 months of, of virtual learning, making it tougher probably than any other me entering medical students have ever had to deal with. So I, I truly applaud you for the commitment and hard work to date. And I will make a promise to you that as you work harder the next four years, as an institution, we'll continue to support you in all your endeavors and really, as Dr. Hushman said, prepare you to join the workforce and in the medical profession as an outstanding physician. So we're excited to see you here today. We're excited to see your growth over the next four years, and I look forward to seeing you again on the University of Green in 2025 is what I heard, 2025, June of 2025, or May of 2025, to celebrate your graduation. So best of luck to all of you, and I look forward to seeing great things from all of you. Thank you, Dr. Lohman. As I mentioned when I visited your active learning groups on Wednesday, studying and practicing medicine is a powerful bond that unites us across time and place. As medical students and physicians, we have an enduring commonality that will forever bind us together and support us in our professionalism, our high ethical standards, and compassionate care of our patients. Each year we select a white coat speaker who demonstrates the very highest ideals of our profession. It is an honor for me to introduce this year's speaker, Dr. Lucy Rourke Adams. Her bio is in, our is in your booklet, so I'm not going to read it to you. 
It captures her stellar professional accomplishments, but doesn't totally do justice to the measure of the person and the physician. Dr. Rourke Adams truly epitomizes the highest ideals of our profession. She came to Philadelphia from the University of Minnesota Medical School for her residency at what was then Philadelphia General Hospital, which is, was a tax-supported municipal hospital in Philadelphia that delivered care to a mainly underserved population. Dr. Rourke Adams retired six years ago from Children's Hospital Philadelphia as a senior pediatric neuropathologist as well as a clinical professor of pathology and laboratory medicine at the University of Pennsylvania. She leaves a legacy of important findings on the development of the infant brain, the origin and classification of childhood brain tumors, shaken baby syndrome, and central nervous system disorders unique to children. She revels in the reality that there is always something new and challenging in her work. She believes that the opportunity of something new constantly revealing itself drives you to learn more and to do more. I have been personally blessed to have gotten to know Dr. Rourke Adams. She will share some of her experiences, interactions, and keen insights that have aided her with building a love for her career in medicine that has spanned over 50 years. Please join me in welcoming this compassionate pathologist Dr. Rourke Adams. Thank you, Dr. Riboli. It is indeed an honor and a privilege for me to participate in this milestone in your medical career. You have selected a medical school in which there is a great emphasis on humanism. And during the coming four years, your mentors will emphasize the importance of compassion in your dealing with your patients, their families. Now you might ask why a pathologist has been invited to give a talk to you on this occasion. Pathologists, as you know, are specialists in medicine who diagnose diseases by examination of tissues that are sent to the laboratory from the operating room and who do post-mortem examinations on individuals who have died. We are basically consultants to the clinicians. We, in general, do not have any contact with the patient or the family. The Dalai Lama has said, made a very profound statement in which he said, love and compassion are necessities, not luxuries, and humanity cannot survive without them. What I'd like to do is share with you in the next few minutes some examples of the manner in which I practiced pathology and situations which called upon my compassion for patients who I never saw, who never knew of my existence. There was a young couple in, who lived in a suburb of Philadelphia who had a baby. The baby was two months old, and he developed some gastrointestinal problems. He was hospitalized at the Abington Hospital and uh, he became quite ill uh, beyond his gastrointestinal problems and became comatose. A CAT scan was done and it disclosed a hemorrhage in his brain. He was transferred to the Children's Hospital and the pediatricians caring for him were very concerned because they did not feel that the parents were sufficiently upset at the severe uh, illness of their baby. And when they saw that there was a hemorrhage in the brain, they postulated that this baby had been the victim of child abuse. 
They contacted the prosecutor of Montgomery County uh, and voiced their suspicions. And uh, unfortunately, the baby died. I was told about the suspicions of the clinicians. I got a call from the prosecutor who wanted to have immediate information on uh, what the nature of the brain problem was. And he was very eager to go and arrest the parents. So we did the autopsy, and I found, yes, indeed, there was a hemorrhage in the brain. But it was not characteristic of the kinds of hemorrhages that we see in babies who are abused. So I said to the pediatricians and the prosecutor, I think we have to wait until I've completed my study before you do anything. A week went by, and I got a frantic call from the prosecutor, who was extremely upset because the parents of the baby, after the funeral, had decided to take a cruise. And this confirmed their impression that these were heartless people who had really done something terrible to their baby. And so they were going off on this happy cruise after the funeral. Another week went by, and I got the sections of the blood clot and was able to diagnose the fact that the blood clot was not a consequence of anything that had been done to this baby, but was a result of a rupture of a vascular malformation in this baby's brain. Vascular malformations are not uncommon in children. They're congenital abnormalities. So when I called the prosecutor and I said, you don't need to do anything as far as these parents are concerned, save them the trauma of not only losing their baby, but being accused of having done something to this baby. The seven-year-old boy came to the hospital and the studies suggested that he had a brain tumor. Now the brain tumor was thought to be in an unusual part of the brain. The major part of our brain, which is up here called the cerebral hemispheres, is where many of the tumors are located. This particular tumor was thought to be in the part of the brain called medulla. The medulla is the lowest part of the brain stem, and it connects the brain with the spinal cord. Now, brain stem tumors are quite common in children, but they're much more commonly located in the middle part of the brain stem called the pons. Brain tumors in the medulla are very rare. So as was uh, the practice, the surgeon took this child to the operating room. He sent a piece of tissue for a frozen section, and the pathologist in the laboratory is accustomed to getting these tissues. We do a rapid section uh, so we can look at the tissue with the microscope and give the surgeon some idea of what he's dealing with. So I got this very tiny piece of tissue. The medulla is a part of the brain that is very, very small. It, in a seven-year-old boy, would be about the diameter of a three-quarters of an inch. And there are very many extremely important structures in that area. Uh, two of them primarily control cardiac function and respiration. So there isn't much space for the surgeon to uh, manipulate. And uh, they, he has to be, he or she has to be very careful about not taking too much tissue. I looked at the slide, and I immediately called the operating room. The surgeon's name was Derek. We were on very good terms. So I said, Derek, stop what you're doing. Close up. This boy does not have a tumor. So he said, well, what does he have? He has Alexander's disease. 
Now, Alexander's disease is a very, very rare disorder. Primarily affects children and primarily affects the front part of the brain up here. There were two cases in the world's literature of Alexander's disease presenting in the brain stem. And in both of those cases, the abnormality was located in the pons and was only diagnosed at autopsy. Well, Dr. Bruce took my advice, closed up, and I'm very happy to report that this boy was saved, his cardiac function and respiratory function, and uh, lived for some years after this surgery. One day I got a call from a young neuropathologist who was assistant to one of my close colleagues. She was a very experienced pediatric neuropathology pathologist. She had a very excellent reputation and we were very good friends. So her assistant called me and he said, I'm having an argument with my boss and I'd like to send you some slides of a case that we're arguing about. So will you look at it? So I said, well, what's the problem? Well, the problem was that he diagnosed a tumor in a baby that was a newly described entity, which two colleagues of mine uh, at the Children's Hospital and I had recently defined. This was a tumor that occurred primarily in babies. Uh, it had a terrible prognosis and uh, was constantly being misdiagnosed as another type of common brain tumor. And my colleagues and I at the Children's had studied a number of such cases, and we had written a paper about it. So this young man was familiar with our paper, so he was calling me to ask if I would look at these sections to determine whether he was correct or whether his experienced colleague was correct. So the slides arrived. I looked at the slides. I called him back and I said, I think you're right. I think you've made the correct diagnosis. So uh, go ahead and uh, write your report. And then I called my colleague because she was a very longtime friend and I thought it was the kind thing to do to call her up and let her know that I disagreed with her. So I did that. And then she said to me, well, we must be having an epidemic of this tumor because we had another one last week. So I said, oh, that's interesting. And then she said, would you like to see it? So I said, of course, send it on. So a day or so later, some slides arrived. Well, I looked at the slides and I was stunned to see that she had made a second mistake because the tumor in this particular baby who was nine months old was a completely different tumor, also one which occurs primarily in babies, but one which is completely curable by surgery. The prognosis for the other diagnosis was absolute death within a year or less. That first diagnosis, uh, oh, I'm sorry, the diagnosis in the second case had been sent incorrectly and the oncologist had already started to treat the baby with chemotherapy. So now I'm faced with a dilemma. Do I call my colleague a second time and tell her she's wrong? Or do I just quietly say nothing and allow the baby with a curable tumor to be treated with the wrong treatment? I picked up the phone and I called her and I said, I'm very sorry to disagree with you a second time. But the tumor you diagnosed as a rhabdoid tumor, which is what the other one was called, 
is not a rhabdoid tumor. It's a DIG, not a DIG, D-I-G-G, -G, was uh, an abbreviation for the long, complicated name of this particular tumor. So I said to her, you tell the neurosurgeon to go back in and take out the remains of this tumor because this baby will be cured. So she said to me, I didn't send this case to you as a consultation. I said, I know you didn't, but I feel that it's very important for this family to know that they have a baby with a tumor that can be cured. So she said, thank you very much. The next day she called back and she said, uh, would you write a, an official report? So I said, yes. So I wrote a report and then I didn't hear anything. Six months later, I was at a brain tumor meeting and also attending this meeting was the oncologist from the hospital where she worked. So he sought me out and he said, you know, it's so wonderful that you got that consultation. So I said to him, what happened when you called the parents in to tell them that their baby was not going to die within a year, but could be cured by further surgery? Well, he said, you can imagine how they felt. And I can imagine how they felt. One day we had a three-year-old who came to the hospital who had a brain tumor, which was very unusual in children. Now this particular brain tumor has a rather forbidding name. It's called a glioblastoma multiforme. And you're probably more familiar with it because Senator Teddy Kennedy died from this tumor. John McCain, also a senator, had the same tumor and died. And I think President Biden's son also had the same kind of tumor. It's a tumor largely of adults, occurs only rarely in children. So this child came in, I had to make that diagnosis, and treatment was begun. So this child had a five-year-old brother, and the five-year-old brother began acting in a strange way. And at first the parents were thought that the child was just seeking attention. So they didn't pay too much attention to him. But his strange behavior continued, so they brought him to the hospital. He was studied, and he had exactly the same kind of tumor as his three-year-old brother. Treatment was started for both of them. Sadly, the three-year-old died. And one day I'm in my office and the oncologist came in, closed the door and started to cry. And he said, gave me the child's name, just died. He said, I can't face those parents. What can I say? What can you say in the face of such overwhelming tragedy? These were the only two children of this young couple. I comforted my colleague as best I could, but words do not, there are no words in the English language that will be of proper comfort. I was at the children's hospital for 50 years, and on my last day at the hospital, there came a knock at my door. There was a young man standing in the doorway whom I didn't recognize at all. He identified himself and he said he worked in one of the departments of the hospital. And he said to me, I heard that you were retiring and I wanted to come and wish you well because 10 years ago you gave me a cup of coffee. I was speechless. It made apparent to me that it doesn't matter 
what we look like, what our station in life is, but we are a family. And it is my joy and pleasure today to welcome you to the family of medicine. God bless you all. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Work Adams. This is a small token of our appreciation for you. And now I'd like to introduce Assistant Dean for Student Affairs, Dr. Aaron Pukenis, who will lead the ceremonial cloaking of our students. Dr. Pukenis. Thank you, Dean Raboli. Good afternoon, all. Students, it is an honor to share in this day with all of you in person and with your families and friends, both in person and virtually. Now is the moment you've been waiting for. We're going to begin the ceremonial cloaking. In a few minutes, each of you will be called to the stage where you will don your white coat for the first time. You will also receive a very special gift, a new Littman cardiology stethoscope from the medical staff of Cooper University Healthcare. Joining us today is Dr. Kara Applin, Vice President of the medical staff. Dr. Applin, thank you to you and the Cooper medical staff for your generosity. At this time, I will begin to call students to the stage. Please remember to maintain your distance as you move across the platform and as you line up. I also want to acknowledge, in addition to your family and loved ones here and watching at home, our advisory college directors, represented today on stage by Dr. Lisa Reed. The advisory colleges serve as a learning community model for professional identity formation, social and emotional well-being, and specialty career exploration. Our advisors will have the special honor of cloaking each student. As we call the students to the stage, audience, I'm going to ask that you hold your applause, please, until after all of the students have donned their white coats. Would the students of Rush Advisory College please stand and proceed to the stage? Priscilla Awan. Jacob Barr. Vipple Bot Amy Bordonia Nicole Debsky. Michael Dubinsky.
Alyssa Exaharkis. Kevin Gureshi. Amy Gilligan. Paige Hyman. Christina Hum. Abby Sincolidampo. Mia Lang. Sarah Levine. Alexandria Nichatsky. Logan Napoli. Rashma Paul. Silas Prasad. Sanjana Rajendran. Nicole Schmolbach. Bryce Showell.
Samuel Snyder. Sabadra Thumpy. Anthony Tigano. Gabriella Yao. Raishi Yaram. Jolie Zilka. Osler College, please proceed to the stage. Janet Aliyev. Gianna Antonori. Milan Aria. <laughs> Stefano Benincasa. Tyler Tolan Carroll. Amir Davuti. Jack Donlin.
Avery Galino. Hui Ha. Justin Halim. Taylor Hebert. Lauren Holman. Amal Khan. Lucinda Lau. Jordan Moas. Kelsey Murray. Ryan Park. Ami Patel. Mary Pencoffer. Aaron Sanzone. Aliza Shaquille.
Farouk Sheikh. Joseph Sickle. Renee Spencer. Angela Sun. Dylan Wendell Puente. Lily Ziang. Cushing College, please rise and proceed to the stage. Alexandros Athenos. Akanksha Anandanandrajan. Seku Bayou. Maxwell Boker. Sophia Christophus. Isabella Di Gregorio.
Hannah Diosti. Benjamin Feng. Roshni Gandhi. Alexander Grafstrom. Archit Gupta. Jane Hatzell. Monica Kisara. Kelly Kim. Adam Mangold. Nicole Malcury. Treen Wynn. Zachary Padron. Samantha Pastori. Rohan Paturu.
Samantha Rosa. Ashley Russell. Daniel Schneider. Alexis Sieber. Matthew Stern. Jesse Vigiano. Catherine Zhang. Christopher Zhao. Blackwell, please proceed to the stage. Zain Abidin. Christy Ahanat. Hyder Ali Khan. Mega Andrews. Carol Cheney.
Teresa Cotino. Lindsay Dijon. Reed Firestone. It's harder than it looks, actually. <laughs> Julia Fleming. Daniel Gerges. Caroline Gutowski. Tiffany Jakowczyk. Ina Lin. Rohini Madagunta. Diego Martinez Castaneda. Mitchell McDaniels. Abhinav Nair. Cynthia Wynn. Pranav Patel.
Savannah Peterson. Katie Ramdiel. Dominic Scolia. Emily Serrata. Elena Sierra. Dante Terracciano. James Waters. Cassandra Yap. And finally, we'd like to recognize two students who are joining us remotely today, Marnie Goldstein and Kimberly Eberens. That concludes our cloaking audience. Please join me in congratulating the class of 2025. Students, when you reach into your coat pockets, you will find notes, your white coat notes. These notes were written by your family, friends, faculty, fellow students, and loved ones in an expression of support and encouragement on this very special day in your medical education journey. Please save these notes so that you may look back on this day and the future and recognize how much you have grown. At this time, I would like to introduce Dr. William Coker, Associate Dean for Admissions, who will be leading us in the recitation of the Hippocratic Oath. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Dr. Bill Coker, and I serve as the Associate Dean for Admissions at Cooper Medical School of Rowing University. And just in case you didn't know, I'm also a pathologist. <laughs> if that doesn't confirm for all of you that pathology is the most important subject you'll study, I don't know what will. Right? Yeah, there you go. Anyway, I just want to say you all look fabulous in your white coats. Tremendous congratulations. In just a few moments, I'll have the privilege of administering 
the Hippocratic Oath to all of you um, for the very first time. But before that, I'd like to add my personal thanks to Dr. Rourke Adams for her inspiring words today. Uh, you may not be aware of this, but aside from her innumerable contributions to the field of medicine that were mentioned in the uh, program, Dr. Rourke Adams also single-handedly, I believe, provided education in pediatric neuropathology to entire generations of aspiring pathologists. Uh, and, uh, you know, throughout the Philadelphia community, and for that, we are all grateful. So the white coat ceremony today has a bit of a special significance for me because back in 1977, 1977, when I was a newly minted first year medical student, our white coat ceremony was a little different. It basically consisted of a visit to the university bookstore. You figured out your size and you bought your white coat. <laughs> that was it, no special ceremony. But another reason this year is special for me is it actually marks the 40th anniversary of the first time I took the Hippocratic Oath. And that was on the day of my graduation from medical school. The version of the oath we're going to recite today is a modified version of the modern oath and it's actually the same oath I recited 40 years ago. So at this time, I'd like to ask all of our students to rise. I'd also like to invite all my colleagues uh, on the stage, in the audience, and for any of you viewing at home uh, remotely to also rise and renew your oaths. So please join with me now in the recitation of the Hippocratic Oath. I do solemnly swear by that which I hold most sacred that I will be loyal to the profession of medicine and just and generous to its members, that I will lead my life and practice my art in uprightness and honor, that into whatsoever house I shall enter, it shall be for the good of the sick to the utmost of my power, holding myself aloof from wrong, from corruption, from the tempting of others to vice that I will exercise my art solely for the cure of my patients and will give no drug, perform no operation for a criminal purpose, even if solicited, far less suggested. That whatsoever I shall see or hear of the lives of my patients, which is not fitting to be spoken, I will keep inviolably secret. These things I do promise, and in proportion as I am faithful to this oath, May happiness and good repute be ever mine, the opposite if I shall be forsworn. Thank you and congratulations. Thank you, Dr. Coker. Congratulations again to the class of 2025. Uh, I'd like to once again uh, ask for a round of applause to show our appreciation to Dr. Rourke Adams. <laughs> I'd also like to thank all of our guests today, including those who are uh, involved remotely, viewing this uh, uh, event remotely. Uh, we will be having a, an event on the um, pa patio outside, on Wilson patio under the tent uh, with some snacks and things and just a little get together. I'm gonna ask the students to stay behind so that we could take a photo. And um, I'd also like to thank uh, the folks who don't get the recognition that they so richly deserve. It takes a lot of individuals to put this event together. Uh, the Office of Student Affairs, Dr. Pekenis, Dr. Marion Lombardi, who couldn't be here today, Janine Thomas and others in that office, uh, Lori McFadden from my office, uh, and um, Gail Stevens and Sharon Clark, who uh, also uh, work on this event. So uh, please extend a thanks to them as well. Uh, when you see them, they might be circulating around the patio. So uh, this concludes the event, and again, congratulations, everyone. <laughs>